would anyone like to go first? Uh, Quentin. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, really enjoyed the presentation and we've had a, a private message exchange, but other people might be interested in this. I was just curious to know about how you get the high export tariff um, because we advise groups in Cumbria and do exactly what you talked about as happening, and that is end up sizing a system to meet the the, the local on-site demand because people look at the smart export guarantee scheme and see three, four, five, six pence a kilowatt hour and think that's not worth doing. Um, so, yeah, could you talk us through that? That would be really helpful. Uh, I, uh, yeah, I'm happy to. I can't claim all the credit or any of the credit for the for securing the high export rates. Um, so uh, our role as asset developer is to take the site to point of commissioning. Uh, once it's commissioned, uh, then uh, Bright, uh, Bright Renewables, who are the asset manager for, in this instance, Bathurst Community Energy, uh, negotiate and aggregate the PPA deals. Um, so I'd be more than happy to introduce you to these guys. Uh, but what they do is that they aggregate uh, the PPAs across a number of the sites that are held within Bath and West Community Energy and effectively trade that uh, as a whole. So, you know, if you're going in small with kind of, you know, a few kilowatts here, a few kilowatts there, it's not necessarily that meaningful to the market. But if you're going in with, you know, a meg, two, or, or, or 13 and a half megawatts, uh, as Bath and West Community Energy have, that's suddenly much more interesting to the market. Um, so um, uh, it's uh, Bright Renewables, uh, Amy McNamara, uh, was the lady involved with it, um, and I can I can track down her details uh, if you want to know more about it. So it's not the sort of thing you can secure um, domestically. Um, you have to have scale, uh, and that was secured. That was secured in the summer. Uh, so where it is now, I don't know. Um, but there are definitely much better than SEG deals out there. Um, I would certainly, if I'm building a business case, um, I would expect a minimum of twelve. Uh, pence um you know the days of sort of the poultry sort of four or five pence uh have have gone for the moment and then it's really a case of um what do you believe and what do you need to believe uh for those rates to stay high um and that is a very very complicated question uh tied up in all sorts of uh, geopolitics um my personal view uh is that they're probably going to stay high for quite some time um i think we'll see um you know, domestic around the 30 pence uh, and uh, commercial around the sort of the 40 to 50 pence for the next three to five years. Um, we're not going to be dropping down to, you know, 15, 20p like we used to have. Um, but there are lots of things which could change that. Um, you know, there could be some significant moves uh, to move that up <clears throat> and down. Uh, and that's what, uh, you know, the energy analysts and the energy traders are, are trying to make money out of uh, in the open market. Um, uh, Connie's uh, just mentioned that Unity offer uh, quite a good export rate um, with no minimum volume. What was the minimum volume for Bright Renewables? I might have missed it. Um, if you, if you uh, uh, the, the, there wasn't a minimum volume. It was more that the more you have, the more you can trade. Uh, uh, Sarah from Ace yeah. Settle. Hi, um, hi John. Um, I'm up in North Yorkshire in Settle. Um, we've got an action, a climate action group, and we're trying to develop our community energy. Um, and what we wanted to do is to try and involve initially um, a variety of community buildings, um, some of whom already have solar panels, some don't, um, and also to try and kind of equal out the whole kind of social differential between people who um, just can't afford to put um, rooftop solar on their domestic property. So we're going to work with Energy Local uh, to do some of that. Um, the only slight sna snag we have is that whilst we can get a lot of that going potentially, um, is that we want to try and balance out solar for obvious reasons, you know, throughout seasons and, and throughout the year. Um, I know you're obviously just focusing on, on rooftop solar, um, but do you have any experience with where communities have tried to do the same? And we, you know, we have quite a lot of wind uh, up in North Yorkshire. Um, so we are looking potentially at turbines of varying different sizes. Um, but I just wondered if, if you had any insight into, into kind of having a, a broad portfolio and how that, that might be achievable. Uh, yes, yeah, so within the group, um, we look at sort of hydro, wind, uh, all sorts of things. Typically, uh, community groups will start with solar because it's, it's the easiest yeah. uh, of them all. Um, the hydro we're aware of um, is a thorn in people's side. Um, it's it's never as easy as you think, and you create a bit of a monster. Um, mm. 
So that might have moved on. And wind until recently had been very challenging from a planning perspective. Um, that planning landscape is is moving, but I'm not quite sure how far, how fast. Um, uh, so um, I'm hoping that you know onshore wind becomes much uh, uh, much more prevalent. Um, but there, yeah, you know, it's not been a sudden resurgence. I think there's still a hesitation uh, around moving into that. Um, so so yes, we do have some experience of it, um, but it's it's mostly solar for community groups where we start. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, John. Tony. Hello, uh, can you hear me all right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm, we're in a sort of a, a infant stage of a community energy group uh, in Belper in Derbyshire, and we want to major on rooftop solar for the sort of reasons you've just given. So we've heard some disturbing stories about, about grid reinforcement problems and that um, community energy applications are stacking up. Because of the, of the of the they're being told they're going to have to wait ages for for for, for hookups. Is it, is this a scaremongering or what? Do you what's your view on it? Um, well, it, it sort of it is and isn't a problem. Um, it, certainly for some of the larger scale work, uh, the ground mounted projects, uh, we're seeing connection dates. I think we had one this week of twenty thirty six. I mean, <laughs> how are we going to yeah. get to net zero <laughs> by then? I've got no idea. Uh, but what we're finding with rooftop. Um, is that as long as you can keep the export below a certain level, uh, typically sort of 95, 100 kilowatts, um, you can actually go quite big on the roof. So as long as you've got demand on site, um, yeah. you can go to a 250, 300 kilowatt system, but then you'll develop an export limitation scheme to make sure that it stays below that 100. And we're getting stuff signed off, no problem at all. Um, that does mean that you have to consider uh, the size of the system against the on-site consumption. And make sure that the majority does get used. Yeah. Um, but you know, you've, as long as you're not building a business case around export, then that should be fine. Right. So, um, yeah, sorry. I was just so yeah, so it I, goes, I goes like back. To put you off. It goes back to the, uh, the first question, which I was certainly in tune with about where do you get these wonderful export rates from. But that's that's a kind of second issue. Isn't it? If you're if you're expecting to get something out of export, you've got the you've got the grid reinforcement poten potentially an issue, and and the and the uh, the price you're likely to get for it, which is certainly we've 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 set off uh, saying we're only really interested in sites which are going to consume. Yes, and, and yeah. that may not even include schools. Actually, I'm not. We're not sure. We're uh, we're working on a school plus a leisure plus a leisure center. Which which looks pretty good because a lot of daytime usage through the year. Yeah, I mean school schools are are, are good. Um, there, there's a high electrical consumption. Um, they're unfortunately they're not typically there in July and August, which is a problem because that's when you're generating the most electricity. Uh, but the shoulder season more than make up for it. Uh, and depending on how the school operates, uh, quite a lot a lot will. Uh, rent the school out during the summer holidays for camps and clubs and whatever else. So the consumption doesn't go to zero uh, during that period. So you have to look at it in the rounds um, and accept that, you know, you're not going to make your money uh, during the summer periods as you normally would. You make it on the shoulder periods. Um, but mm. schools definitely work. Um, I would just back briefly on the, the export. Uh, export used to be the cherry on the top. You'd never really think about it. It was kind of a balancing item. Um, there is an opportunity for some sites um, where you can go very big on export, um, but that is, I, I would consider that as part of a portfolio. I wouldn't go there as your kind of first solar roof, yeah. uh, but as you build up critical mass, then that's definitely a place that you could uh, you could explore. Um, Nigel, have you got your hand up digitally? Hi there, hi there, John. Uh, we're a, a small village in Hampshire, um, keen to put some solar on commercial on um, community buildings. We don't have much uh, daytime use, so the high export price is is, is very attractive. Um, but is there any scope with uh, for batteries, or uh, is that going to be unviable? Um, it, well, it's um, it's a case by case uh, review for batteries. Um, from a uh, from a carbon perspective, I'm not a big fan. Um, they toss, they cost about a ton of carbon per kilowatt hour that you're creating. Oh. Um, so if, if your goal is carbon reduction, it's not necessarily the right place to go. Okay. Um, however, um, you know, there are arbitrage opportunities um, where you can go for day-night pricing. You can definitely uh, 
uh, really push up the on-site consumption. Uh, yeah. But what we found is that from a financial perspective, you're actually better off accepting a lower on-site consumption than the cost of installing uh, and maintaining batteries. That that's the norm. However, okay. um, you know there are uh, there are exceptions to that, uh, and some in some cases it will work. Um, but my my sort of personal thing is that you know with a battery you're not actually generating any more energy no. you're just shifting it around yeah um so you're not really decarbonizing uh, okay. with that right thanks a lot so just just going to the chat um there's a battery question from Gillian around uh, 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 uh balancing uh grid infrastructure um, so I mm -hmm. guess that's around yeah. those export limits. So if you can if you can do some quite accurate profiling on your energy usage and just work out exactly when you'll be kind of tripping those points of oh this is when we're um, at peak generation and, and and need to to be lower than the constraint, then you can really um, accurately size your battery system. And I think Energy Local um, have been looking at that, which is quite good. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, batteries definitely have a place. You know, we're going to have uh, intermittent generation, so we need we need storage. Um, I ju I'm just not um, yet convinced uh, that lithium batteries are the way to do it uh, in a domestic setting. I think we need um, distribution scale, transmission scale, uh, storage systems. Um, so I, I'm I'm not yet convinced, but I'm I'm open to the debate, but I'm not yet convinced on that. Um, uh, Connie, your hands up. Oh, I think it was Gillian first. Oh, Gillian. Sorry, I'm, I can't see. That's Where's Gillian? Right. Just coming back on the question I asked, it was it was partly about balancing the grid, but it was basically we had a meeting with our um, local council this week about um, the idea of putting solar panels on carports on park and ride sites. And one of the things they said there, they reiterated that they've been told by the national grid that for any major infrastructure changes round about Chester, they're looking at about 2030-ish timescales. So what they were suggesting, instead of going for a large-scale solar production where we could feed it back into the grid and export it, we might be forced down the battery route as a way of not doing the infrastructure changes to the grid yet because we, we simply can't get them done. So it was more of a, not as a we prefer to go down the battery route. We just might end up there because we can't export high amounts into the grid. Yeah, yeah. The, it's, it, there's no easy answers, are there? And <laughs> stuff like that. Um, so yeah, sometimes you, you, your hand is forced uh, to do something like that. Um, so so yeah, you have to. Uh, I think um, carports uh, is an interesting one. I think um, again, there's a lot of embodied carbon with the extra footings and steelworks that you happen to put into that those huge canopies. Um, uh, you, you may have noted that in France, um, car parks over 80 spaces now need to put solar panels on top. Um, that solar panel is is very sort of, it's a small incremental cost because they tend to cover all their car parks anyway because of the sun and the damage to the car and the, the heating risks. Um, whereas actually um, putting carports in is, is both expensive um, and a, quite costly in terms of carbon so if there are nearby buildings where you can in, put solar on instead where the you know the roof is already there and the structure is already there that would always be my preference um tony um yeah i just wanted to add that it's still still on batteries um just from a purely i mean i hadn't really thought too much about the that i didn't know about the ton of carbon per kilowatt hour but from a financial point of view um the reason we were looking at batteries was because obviously then the more the more that can go if we sort of charge per at the point where it's going into the battery then it's obviously like less exporting to the grid and then we can earn more as well so it's more financially viable um and i just thought surely if it's not going back to the grid that might balance out a bit with the carbon potentially i, I don't know enough about it but i just wanted to hear your thoughts on so financially, yeah. so you can financially you can make batteries work, um, particularly with day night arbitrage. Um, so you know, from a from a personal perspective, yeah, you know, I'm on the Octopus Go tariff. Um, I pay a, a, a tiny rate at night and a bonkers rate in the day. Um, so the more I can push into nighttime, the better. Or if I had a battery uh, to charge that up and then discharge during the day, would mean that I wouldn't uh, have to pay those rates. 
And an argument can be made um, for that grid, that grid energy that you import at night, uh, where the grid intensity and the carbon intensity is much lower, means that you then don't need to uh, burn fuel during the day when the prices are higher. Uh, we've looked into that, and actually it's quite marginal, uh, but it is very, very specific about where you live. Uh, so you have to consider that as well, and you can get really complicated really quickly. Um, but you know, fundamentally, a, a battery doesn't generate any more electricity. It is just pushing things around, uh, which is an important balancing aspect uh, and something that's very much needed you know, up into the grid. Um, uh, but where we've looked at some systems, we looked at a system for a farmer, uh, a dairy farmer, not a community uh, project one. Uh, but what we found is that uh, it was either a 15 kilowatt system um, or he could go up to a 30 kilowatt system uh, and export loads more, but he'd still have a better return than a 15 kilowatt system plus a battery. Uh, and you have to almost accept the wastage that you're going to push more into the grid. Um, but he was he was happy to do that. He was an um, uh, organic farmer, supplies weight rows, uh, and he could see doubling the carbon benefits mm -hmm. was much more important to him than trying to drive on-site consumption. So you've got to look at you know, what's your motivation for doing this. Um, and it is a bit of a whack-a-mole stroke waterbed of different things which will go on. Uh, but just be mindful uh, of all the different um, consequences, the unintended consequences of stuff that you're doing. Um, Quentin. Yes, sorry. Can I just come back to you on the battery thing? I'm, I'm puzzled. I've been listening to the conversations and looking at the chat, so I may have missed a key point. Can you just talk me through the carbon footprint of the battery that you were saying was putting you off the battery? I mean, clearly there's the manufacture of it, but then once you've got it, you've got it. And if you use it a lot, that allows you to use more renewable electricity rather than non-renewable electricity that you might access from the grid. So, but I'm, I'm clearly missing something yeah. here. No, no, no. It's, um, so it's, um, you can do a quick kind of um, you know, pen and paper calculation on it. Um, so we spoke to PowerVault. Uh, about the kind of end-to-end -end, uh, carbon uh, cost. Uh, and that's the figure of uh, one tonne of carbon per kilowatt hour they create. So that's your creation. You're absolutely right. Once, once it's installed, you're done. There's no more to worry about. But if then look at the arbitrage between you know, uh, the grid carbon of 200 grams per kilowatt hour uh, versus the sort of the uh, you know, zero carbon of excess solar on the roof or that sort of thing, um, what you find is that if you cycle the battery, uh, 13 and a half kilowatt hours or whatever size battery it is, with that difference, will you ever pay back uh, that ton of carbon? And we we calculated it, and I don't have the calculator time, but it was about 20 years uh, to pay back that cost of creation. Uh, and then you think to yourself, well, actually, the battery's only warranted for 10. How many of these batteries are going to be there in 20 years, or are they going to be on to you know, secondary or tertiary lives? or hopefully recycled. So uh, our perspective, um, but again, it, it's changing. And this is this is lithium battery specific. Um, if you move to flow batteries or that type of thing, it's a very different conversation. Um, is that if, you're, if your ultimate goal is carbon reduction, I, I would hesitate uh, around lithium batteries. And I, and I think, John, there's another point in there is the grid decarbonizes that 250 figure is going to come down so it will take even longer to, to, to potentially pay back so so that's a very good point that i think that um we need to be looking to the battery industries to to really be considering the different technologies so yeah but you i mean you can you can really kind of push this point yeah solar panels yeah are manufactured predominantly in china from coal-fired power stations <laughs> so you know, the, the grid intensity on those means that typically a solar panel has to wait three years before it's paid its carbon back. Um, so, you know, you, you, it's very difficult and it's an absolute minefield, uh, all of this. But batteries is one that we don't think will ever uh, pay back. It's certainly not lithium. Um, I'm not, I, I can see the chat moving, but I'm not good at kind of answering the question and looking at chat and looking at people. So, Sorry, that um, was meant to be my... my, um, <laughs> my that's right. So if, if anyone's got anything on the chat, if they want to, um, if they want to sort of put their hand up and ask the question, uh, otherwise I'll just, I'll get lost in a sea of, of words. Uh, Peter. 
Sorry, it was just John. It was just re reflecting on that last point. Actually, I've added something into the chat, really, which was that your example of the farm is, is, is quite a good one, isn't it? You know, it, was it better for them to produce 15 kilowatts with a battery and use it all themselves or, or to, to go 30 kilowatt and export to the, to the grid? Now, in terms of decarbonisation, there's, no, there's no, no debate. 30 kilowatts is better than 15. Um, so collect, you know, if, if you look at the bigger picture, that's a better overall result. And clearly you should, you've saved the, the tonne of carbon for the battery. Yeah, and, and actually it was the, exactly the same at economic return. Uh, because he didn't need to invest so much money in batteries, yeah. um, so that that was the sort of the really interesting bit for us. Yeah. Um, actually, the 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 best number uh, solar only I think was I think it was twenty or twenty five, where you accept a little bit more loss. But he decided to go to the full thirty, and as long as he was better than with a battery, he was happy. Yeah. So yeah, a, a good result. Yeah. Um, Tom, I think I don't know if you were first up, but um, it's the first I saw. I think it was Paul actually was next. Oh, was it Paul? Paul, do you want to go first? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, just uh, just a, a comment back to something that was said earlier about possibly being better to use on site solar generated, being imp implying that that's more green than exporting it, and then using grid electricity um, when you're not generated. Uh, the facts are that it doesn't matter where the green energy is generated and used, it's still the same amount of green energy. So if we store it in a battery so that we're not using grid energy later, uh, we're not having a carbon benefit because your green energy that you would have exported instead of storing it is going to be used within the mix on the grid. And then when you import back, it's, it makes no difference. So it's not yes. greener to use your own green energy, if you see what I mean. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, yeah. Take your point. Uh, I was talking more uh, from the site's perspective in terms mm -hmm. of what they re record. Yeah, sure, and I, and I think um, it's been a common misconception because I, I put loads of solar panels on my roof, um, and then I was thinking, well, if I get an electric car and charge them up, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, if I only use my solar panels, that's greener. But then I worked it out. And and it's it's not it's uh, um, you you're not totally um, carbon neutral just because you're generating all your own energy because you're still using it from the grid at other times. Yeah, and I think that's why that sort of net number uh, is is critical. Um, Tom, question. Yeah, I do uh, just want to know your experience with the various DNOs around the country. Um, mm -hmm. SSEN. And I've heard that that's, they're not very good. Some DNA is better than others. Um, yeah. Um, so uh, the artist formerly known as WPD, now National Grid, um, is superb. Um, really easy to work with. Um, you ring them up, you get an answer. Um, uh, SSEN, uh, we find to be the opposite. Um, even finding an appointment with them can take months to then have a conversation with the wrong person. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, not all DNOs are created equally. 95% um, of our work is with WPD, which is great. We're, we're based down in the southwest. Uh, where we do straight to other DNOs, uh, it's a mixed bag, but we're very fortunate to have WPD. And a quick supplementary, you know, they've just done the EO re uh, EDC project. Do you know if anybody's actually looked across the whole piece? See if the project pairs together means that we're going to meet our current production targets over the next five years. So I'm struggling to hear the, the, the audio there. It was chopping in and out. A little bit. I don't know if anyone else caught it. Real ED2. Right. Yeah, you know, the new the, the plans that all the DNOs are to put together. Has anybody done uh, across the piece looking at all to see whether collectively we're going to reach our current production? Um, I, I don't know if anyone's looked across. It's not something we've specifically looked at, and I've not seen uh, other people looking at it. That's not to say it's not being done. Um, it may have been done, uh, but it's not something I've, I've come across. Um, I'm conscious that we were due back at 11.20, and I think the questions have dried up. So I think we've timed this perfectly. Well chaired, Callum. Thank you very much. <laughs> Nailed it. No, thank <laughs> you, John. Um, I'll do a summary when we get back in, but yeah. 
really really interesting session so so many thanks for everybody's input and and for your for your um industry insight and expertise so thank you very much john